Great relationships don't just happen. They're designed. Why leave love to chance when you can make strategic decisions in your relationship just like you do in your career? The days of having to settle for mediocre are over. Welcome to Project Relationship. I'm Dr. Jolie Hamilton. Join me as I explore the decisions and choices that make relationships work no matter what life throws your way. It's time to reimagine relationships from the ground up. Let's go. Hi, and welcome to the Project Relationship Podcast. I'm Dr. Jolie Hamilton, and I'm here with my partner, Ken Hamilton. Hello. And we're going to talk today about, well, talking about business. So we've both been entrepreneurs. Um, I am like a, I am a serial entrepreneur. I am. I love being in business for myself. I love so many aspects of it. Ken, you have had more of an entrepreneurial seizure, but (laughs) not, not entirely, but mostly. (laughs) Well, so when you say that, you mean for most of your life, most of your working life, you have worked for corporations. I've worked for corporations. I have, I have trod that path and I have only dabbled with the idea of reaching beyond it. Never Run really some small consultancy much, things, tiny, and yep. and you, but then in 2010, um, we started a business together. We were running a CrossFit gym. Um, CrossFit has its problems, and we don't even need to get into all of that. But not yet, anyways. Not though yet. I will happily dish about that. But we started this gym together, um, and that was your first experience of really taking entrepreneurship seriously yep. so it was our it was. first experience of trying to figure out how to not have running a business run our whole damn lives and that wasn't at all easy because i had no experience it was really it. really hard and... so i think that this can apply this conversation applies to people who have careers that they're very committed to um a career that follows you home a career that um has has like really you identify with it. Yep. It's not just something you do, but it's something you are. And one of the things I've noticed since running the gym and then not running the gym anymore, turning my attention to my corporate job, I realized that a lot of the entrepreneurial energy that went into my business could go into someone else's business. And t- you know, it, I took a different viewpoint. And so even if you're not... You know, building your own business, you're working for somebody else, there's still a lot of these things can Yeah, the principles we found continue. And then, of course, there's the fact that so many of us are working from home now. Yeah. Um, so even if you aren't in business together, you may, in fact, be working in cl- very close proximity to each other. You might also be um, handling distance learning with your kids all in the same space. You, you might be coming up against some of the fundamental aspects of trying to navigate running your whole life yourself versus having a place where you go and do a job and come home and can actually close the door on yeah. that. Um, for me, this has felt sort of natural. I've been in business for myself over and over and over again. It seems to be my natural state. But when we were together, it um, it didn't seem to work very well. We often would fight and the holidays would turn into quite the argumentative, argumentative time. And I didn't really put my finger on that until we'd been at it for a while. So we yeah. did four Christmas seasons, four holiday seasons for us in... Um, running that business together. And that business meant that we were actively running a client-centered, client-oriented experience um, in a location that was far away from our house. It was 35 minutes to get to the place that we were running the gym. And we were doing that in the kind of business that meant that we needed to be there early in the morning and in the evening, the the post nine to five hours. And we were also trying to figure out how to nav- like manage our relationship, which wasn't going very well. No, it wasn't. And the the one thing, those 35 minutes were a time when we would talk yeah, about our would, relationship. So we would sit in the car and talk. And I remember driving our route and thinking, okay, so every every discussion we have had to be chunked basically into 30-minute yeah. chunks. Yep. 
Like that's how it needed to happen. And the upside to that, and I think that the hidden gem in that was discovering that for a person like myself, I could I could talk about a subject forever and often just be repeating the same things over and over again or trying to work through something verbally because I'm extroverted yeah. and that's how I process. And yet that's not necessarily necessary. Yeah. Having a tight timeline, having a, a, a fixed it amount of time. Bounded things. It, it changed the way it felt to have the conversation. Yeah. Knowing that it was going to end naturally when we got there. And so I've taken that home with us. So now we're both working from home um, on separate businesses. But I find that those those tight timelines have really helped. Oh, yeah. Um, I say in the book that business talk is yeasty because it can swell up to fill every space. And I mean it. Yeah. Um, one of the things that the business that we owned together provided was a shared context. There was always a conversation to have. Um, yeah. There was always yep. something to talk about to do with it. There was always a way to avoid the things we didn't want to talk about. Oh, that's true. Yeah. There were always built-in distractions. All kinds of stuff happened in any given day. And if you didn't want to talk about what was hard, you could talk about that instead. Right. And when I say you, I mean me. <laughs> <laughs> well, you were the person who was more avoidant. Yep. Um, you still are the person in this yes, particular relationship who is more am. avoidant. But... When things were, when we first started this relationship, it was extremely challenging to work through our troubles together. We were, yep. um, we were in a non-traditional relationship. Um, we were in a polyamorous relationship and it was, it was complicated by the fact that nobody really wanted to talk about it openly. Yeah. It was, we weren't doing it well. We were ethical non-monogamy yeah, in that everybody knew, but we weren't actually having all the conversations we that needed to be the had. The conversations were missing. The communication was. Yeah. So then, so then thin. business became this thing that we could talk about instead. And I think I, I learned two good lessons. One is if you change the context that you're having a conversation in, yeah. you can often change the outcome of the conversation. So I learned that. I learned that um, those, those, car conversations were helpful in one way because we would be, you know, sitting next to each other facing the same direction. So there's something positional, something like yeah. sensational, something inside my body, a felt sense of being on the same side. But on the other hand, there was this, um, there was this sense that you could run out the clock. Huh. Yeah. Right. <laughs> If you didn't want to talk about something that I really needed to have talk time to talk about, um, all you had to do is come up with other distractions yep. and run out the clock on a 30 minute timer. So now I, I like bringing home the, the timelines, the short timelines, and that has proven helpful, but oh, yeah. running out the clock is a real thing. Mm -hmm. Do you still do like, do you think that you're still doing that? Cause it's harder. I mean, we're here well, in the same space all the time. Here we are. So you mentioned me being avoidant and that was one, that was a really big avoidant move that I would make. And I've been working over time on, on adjusting those to not be avoidant. And so do I run out the clock? Not consciously anymore. Mm -hmm. I don't feel it the way I, I used to feel it. I used to be like, okay, not not thinking, not words in not my like head, but clearly meditated. Yeah, but, but definitely feeling the the impending getting out of the car, and I would just ride it out. And, and then I've seen that on. too in the kids. Some of our kids are more avoidant yep. than others, and and they'll do that. Like they know that in fact we can't just stay there talking about something forever. That's right. So they'll use very long pauses. Yeah. and lots of time to think. Supposedly, it's like writing one of those five-page <laughs> book reports, double space, right? Wide yeah, wide margins. All of a sudden, the margins are two and a half inches wide. <laughs> yes, that's totally what having an early conversation with you was oh. like. There was a lot of white space. That could also be said about all the privilege we both hold. White There's space. a lot of white space. Oh my. Okay. Oh, that's working on that. Huh. Working but on... yes, seriously, the what is happening in your head when you're paused like that? What's going on? I know you process at a different pace than I do. I tend to process really quickly and I speak as I'm processing. One of the things that um, 
that I tell myself is what I'm doing, and while it is what I'm doing, I don't, I'm sure it's not all I'm doing, is running through responses to something you've said. And in my head, I say it, try it on and see if it's actually true. Mm. Like, is that the piece of me that I want to be working with right now? Uh, no, that's a childish little twit. Nope. <laughs> what else we got? What's okay. the next response? And so I'll be, and that's slow and can be lengthened if I think time or feel that time is going to benefit me somehow. I don't feel that anymore. I get frustrated with myself for how long it takes. I've heard you say that. I've heard you say that you're frustrated Yeah. when we're mid conversation about something. And so business talk is tricky because it you want to make good decisions. And so trying things on, trying those ideas yeah. on makes sense. But what I've never really, I like, I don't know that I ever can understand this from the inside. I try those things on, on the, on the outside. I say right. them and then, um, I rely on our take back policy. Our like, Hey, wait, I need to do that again. Yeah. Or no, I was just trying that on. You seem to try them on inside. And the thing that worries me is that I wonder sometimes how many awesome ideas you have had for our businesses, our, my businesses while you're working, our careers, our, our family, how many awesome ideas have you had and then not shared them and they just it's not zero go to live in that land yep it's definitely not zero and i think that while this isn't necessarily specific to this conversation for me i worry about getting locked into having said something which leads us down a path and then i realize that what i said wasn't true but we're down the path anyway and, and that's so happened my i mean <laughs> it does happen but it's not universal at all because we have an agreement of being able to back out from from statements that we have decided to revise. Although that was hard one. So maybe that's part of the process for us yeah. has been discovering that you needed a lot of um, permission giving. Like you didn't actually need my permission, not literally, but um, the reinforcement that it's okay to say something and then take it back. You needed to hear that over and over I again. I did because I'm very, very, and I'm very afraid of being wrong Oh, shocking. Even, even right? Even Ken, by the my... arbiter of right and wrong. Oh, my. That's going back. Away. Well, it is. I mean, um, <laughs> your friends. Even my own judgment. Thought of that. Of, yes. And that's not, I don't find that to be true, but yeah. you do have a fear of yep. being wrong. And so those things all combine to make it so that I, I'm not like, here's an idea. Wait, that's dumb. Here's another idea. Well, that's not much better. Like those are the situations that. So sometimes we'll be sitting there in a conversation and there'll be this five minute pause. Yeah. And sometimes I don't even know it's been that long because I'm just off in my own little world, just like our youngest. And then, yes. <laughs> yeah. But it's not music. Our it's youngest a whole child definitely has a world being that. constructed and taken right. down and re. And meanwhile, you're there like looking at your watch saying, uh, I thought we were having a conversation. <laughs> so what I've needed is to learn your language because it's silent <laughs> and I, um, I yeah it it's been so challenging for me to figure yeah. out so the context matters but so does the like the style of conversation for sure I needed to learn what because I don't want to interrupt your thinking but sometimes you're also just like in there on a hamster wheel that you can get stuck and yeah. sometimes I feel like I need to like jar the the process like hey come on out yeah. let's let's finish having this conversation out here so i know that you have um that our communication styles are very different our thinking styles are very different i mean i don't really have one i have a feeling style yeah. developing a thinking style and you're a thinker and it's so much faster um and when when you have when you we've decided okay tight timelines is good let's let's have this little bit of time and we'll have this conversation how what what mechanisms have you come have you come up with to deal with the fact that you're eight steps beyond where i am and in a conversation we're like well we do have a limited amount of time yeah so sometimes what i'll do is start writing down the ideas that i have I'll just like jot them down some somewhere um, so that I'm not babbling my ideas all out while you're still thinking. Um, 
But sometimes what I do is honestly allow myself to think past this problem. Like I'll contextualize it. So I'll, so we'll be having a conversation and I'll like, I will remove myself from that, you know, that particular thing and look at like a wider angle view, a wider angle view. And so I'll still be thinking about the problem, but I'll be letting myself have that time to explore the other contexts, the other ways. So as an example, um, we recently ran into some trouble just around setting up this podcast. I wanted you to weigh in on some of the decisions that we needed to make. And it was, it, it was going a little slow for you. You were just thinking through, but you didn't really know very much about what it took to put together a podcast and what would be yeah. involved. So while we were having that conversation, I started thinking about different conversations we might have. Um, the, the way it would feel to work with you directly again, I started to think about like the, the, the big picture, where does a podcast that I'm actually hosting, um, or co-hosting in this case, where does that fit into my overall business plan? And I just allow myself that space. And that way, when you're ready, more prepared with your thoughts, I'm still in the same topic, but, um, I haven't just stomped all over your ideas. And you haven't had to just wait. I'm not good you, at just waiting. You, you and I I don't like it. Time. It's an easy place to fub. Fub is when you snub somebody with their with your phone. The P H U B. I don't oh. like to do that. And that's a that's a time when it's tempting for me. So it's tempting for me to pick up my phone and start scrolling. Mm-hmm. Um because I know I can bookmark where our conversation was yeah. and come back to it. But that's not the kind of communication I want us to have. Um, and it reinforces the idea that just because your processing is different from mine, um, that, it, that somehow mine is better, which you seem to have. I actually have a bigger problem a with bigger that problem. than you do. I think, I think oh, you're so different. fast and I've always wanted to be fast and I'm not. So I'm like, oh, I want to do it your way. But I, in, in my, whatever it is I'm doing, in my slow way, yeah, I come up with things that you wouldn't. You totally do. You problem solve in other ways. You troubleshoot things far more um, efficiently than I do. Um, even though you're moving at a slower pace, it's more efficient in the long run. Yeah. Um, you also have a different style of creativity. So we come up with very different solutions yes, to problems sure. anyways. Um, and I don't, so earlier you said that I'm a thinker and you're you're a feeler. And what we're referring to there is our Myers-Briggs types, basically. And now Myers-Briggs, it's not a statistically verifiable, like it doesn't, it doesn't hold up quite the same way that um, some of the other personality indicators do. But I find it to be a great language to use to talk about how yeah. differences show yeah. up in our relationships. Yeah. And it can be verified to show up if the person has actually verified, you know, if you get a Myers Briggs and um, your your four letter code there, if you get that, you should self verify. Nobody should give that to you. Mm-hmm. And what happened for us is we got this language that said, "Oh, I'm a thinker." When I'm thinking, it's very facile. It's it's quick. It's um, it's how I make values based decisions. I think right. about them. I think logically about them. You come at the world from a completely different place. You feel your decisions. Yeah. You make values-based decisions based on feelings. I would never think, like I couldn't, I can't even get it out of my language. No, I don't know how you could. I don't, I don't know how you do it, but it means that you have a soul to your decisions that I don't. And I appreciate that deeply. And um, one of the things that I appreciate about your way of solving problems is there's a, there's a thread, there's a, there's a a track of this, because this, there's a logic to it. It has an internal consistency. It's an internal consistency. It can be tracked back. You can prove it. You can write down the steps. If, if, if I had to, I could, I could, I could demonstrate my thought process. That's true. Why did you do it that way? Because doing it the other way doesn't feel good. (laughs) Right. And so you also are a sensate. I am. So you so you literally have, mean how it feels yep. in your body. And I tend more towards being an intuitive type, which means answers appear in my gut spontaneously. It's we are different. I'm extroverted, you're introverted. I am um a judger. I, I discern quickly and decisively. You consider every possibility. Yeah. And you consider them right up to and through your decision making process. Yeah. 
we are- In other words, I second guess. (laughs) We are entirely different. So when it came to running a business together, if we had had the language to have the conversations, if I had understood better how to not just tolerate, but embrace your silences at the time, I I think I do it better now. Um, And if you had understood better that when we needed to make a quick decision, it should become my role. That was when to lean on my strengths. Um, If we had known that, some of our, those first few years could have gone a lot easier. They could have. It took a long, that was hard one knowledge. The self-knowledge that that the intervening years has provided, we are, I didn't even know what my strengths and weaknesses were. I still thought I was a thinking person. And I don't mean necessarily Myers-Briggs, but I thought that I thought my way through everything. You had modeled your thought process on the idea that you could be Spock. Yes, which I cannot <laughs> in any way whatsoever. You are just, no, not pulling it I off. might be able to get the haircut that's body. <laughs> um, Please don't. I've lived through tragic haircuts of yours already. <laughs> so many of them. Well, Let's not go that never way. Never going back to Prince Valley. Let's not go that way. So if we had known that, it would have been great, but we didn't. The cool thing is that that's the kind of self-awareness that's pretty easily gained. If you're open to, if you're open to actually looking at how you actually show up in your conversations. Mm -hmm. So in the book, Project Relationship, I talk about just doing assessments on yourself. And an assessment is just a word to say, just stop and actually consider for a moment, how do I actually show up in my conversations? If we had done that, strategically yes, early strategically. on yeah. and had been willing to receive feedback from our partners about, is this true? <laughs> you know, you yeah. thought you were a thinker and it was, uh, I think we were is five. Though... <laughs> we thought, we thought that, and I believed yeah. you. Right. I took you at your word, even though it wasn't panning out to be very true. And it wasn't until we had a shared, um, counselor, um, who who saw each of us individually who looked right at you and was like oh no yeah. no 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 that's not how you that does that actually fit for you and he get, offered you some other language to try on and yeah. when you realized that you were evaluating decisions through your feelings all of our conversations got easier yes so much easier because it meant that you could accept your irrationality yeah and that gets that us was close hard to a conversation I just had recently with Angela Lucier about um, femininity, about how we have relegated the idea of feelings-based decisions to the idea of feminine. And we have relegated the idea of logic-based decisions yeah, yeah. to the world of masculine. And here we are in these cisgender and, bodies having those two things flipped. Yeah. You'd think that that alone would be enough to point out to us that it's that it's just not, it's not that simple. That simple it's not how things are like R capital a so i i've been interested watching us have this talk all of the things that we've been talking about were um originally talking about talking about business and how to fit it into your life and how to but the specifics about talking it doesn't matter whether we're talking about our relationship our, our intimate relationship or our business relationship, all of these things are valuable. Knowing how I interpret the world and how I approach problems and how I'm likely to look at relationships themselves, knowing that makes the conversations that we're going to have about them easier and more productive. Yeah. we So sometimes when we think about communication styles, um, I think we get a little reductive and we think about, so how do I speak? Literally, how mm-hmm. do I show up in the conversation and speak? Or um, am I following a particular protocol for like healthy communication? Some, you know, something that someone has named a way to healthily communicate. Like, am I using I statements? Am I starting with myself? Yeah. And that is a great move, but the, the technical stuff, that's is, technical yeah. detail. Then there's a bigger picture of, how do I communicate with an authentic self and accept the fact that everyone around me is going to have their own communication styles? You know, we have seven kids. They all each have their own communication style. And there's varying degrees of self-awareness in people about yeah, what that is and how it, how it impacts your relating. 
your way. I mean, I, my way is not the only way. I'm going to, there, I'll start with an I statement. I recognize that my way of communicating is not the only way. And I recognize that I express a lot of frustration when people move at a slower pace or take the long way around a conversation, even though they often come to decisions that I value more than mine. <laughs> I still can re be act resentful. So it's something I'm working on, but it's, yeah, it's taking years. It's taking decades, decades to dig through that. Working together on a business was like a little lab in, okay, <laughs> yeah, spend it every is. minute together. And now what are you going to do? Now what are you going to do? And knowing what we're going to talk about in a moment, like, okay, is this a business conversation or is this a home life conversation? And um, at first, because we had that, that, that car trip, there was sort of, there was a, a natural spot for some talking to happen. But it's pretty easy now. We don't drive anywhere. We stay home. Right. Which so means where conversations can pop up anywhere, now, anytime. We don't work together on the same business, but I have a business. I actually have a couple of them. And you work for a corporation and, but you're right outside my door, you know, and you are my tech wizard. Thank goodness. Um, yeah. Hopefully this trying is recording. To yeah. <laughs> trying to decide, trying to decide when to interrupt your work or um, what, when we should have conversations, when we should record things like this, when trying yeah. to figure this all out is super, super complicated because there's a temptation to try to compartmentalize it and make everything time blocked perfectly. But in actuality, life just doesn't work out yeah, that way. No, it doesn't. Last night, a tech issue caused five hours of unforeseen work. Well, so how do we plan for that? The The best thing that came for me out of, out of actually looking and writing about our, uh, our trying to work next to each other, whether we are working yeah. together or not, yeah. was to simply remember that it wasn't going to go the way we planned and that we could have, we could have a, a, a good intention. So we discovered that, in fact, we work well with an organic style of like allowing the conversations to ebb and flow throughout the day and overlapping a lot. And I will say that that's only possible because we have learned our own and each other's communication styles. I was going to say it also because we've learned how to set boundaries. Mm, we yes. learned how to tell each other now isn't the time. And you still struggle with this. So because yeah, you struggle, so I, do. I don't struggle so much with saying the word no. So I can say this isn't a good time. You struggle. So we got a great tool for you. I got him a stuffed sloth several years ago, and I put a piece of elastic on the arms. And if he's in a space where it's not a good time to interrupt him because he's thinking about a specific project, he's working on something, he puts on the sloth and he wears it around his neck. So the sloth's like a little backpack. Okay, back. so this is I been, love your meeting sloth. And has been, he, he's <laughs> been very useful and very helpful. And until this very moment, I didn't realize that he was setting my boundaries for me. I will definitely, I'll get him something nice for Christmas. Awesome. Okay. So this didn't stay just on the topic of business. I think we could talk about this more, but I want to invite everybody to consider how you have communicated your boundaries yes. around, around this and whether you've figured out what the communication styles that are in your relationship, like how do they match up? Are you unconsciously, are you subtly imagining that your communication style is the correct one and that your partner needs to adjust for that. And if you are, okay, invite a little space into that. Take a breath with it. I see you. I hear you. I'm with you. I understand. And what we can do is take a breath with that and say, no, actually there are many, many ways yeah. to make this world work. And from the other side, if you find yourself thinking that your partner's communication style is the right one, and you're trying to like force yeah, yourself a, into it. There's a lot of yeah. There's yeah. space. There's space for lots of different communication styles. You're there's not nothing wrong with yours. No, it's just it's that's your way. And the two of you or three of you, or however many there are, need to understand over time how these all fit together. Yeah, it's not simple, but we have gotten to a spot where we can manage that. Yes. Okay, we'll come back and visit this again. Yep. But thanks for being with us. Bye.
Thank you for listening to the Project Relationship Podcast with Dr. Jolie Hamilton and Ken Hamilton. If you're enjoying our conversation, we would totally love it if you could drop a rating and a quick review so that people will be able to find us. In episode 10, Ken and I talked about talking. (laughs) Okay, we got a little bit deeper than that. We've had a lot of years to learn the hard way how drastically different communication styles can actually be an advantage if we accept that the way that we think or the way we feel isn't the correct way. It's just a way. The pressures of running a business together have been a spotlight on the weaknesses in our relationship, places that we could hurt each other without meaning to, and a great opportunity to learn how to love each other more skillfully. Self-awareness isn't always easy to stomach, but figuring out how to communicate your boundaries doesn't have to look just one way. For Ken, boundaries at work take the form of a stuffed sloth that he wears like a backpack. You get to make up the rules yourself. Creativity is an asset, so use it. Join us next time when Ken and I delve into a subject that makes people even more touchy than sex. We're going to talk about money. Getting on the same page about money took us years and years, but we found that we actually had a secret weapon for success hiding right in plain sight. We'll share what we did to get the topic of money out in the open, which as a bonus has made it easier to make money too. Until next time, remember relationships can be messy and that's good news.